Hi, I'm Garrett Graff, the director of the Cyber Initiative here at Aspen, and I am pleased to introduce our final session of the Aspen Cyber Summit today. Uh, John Carlin, the chair of the cyber program, is going to be speaking with three of the Capitol Hill's most uh, intelligent and thoughtful cyber voices. Uh, Representative Lauren Underwood, uh, Representative Will Hurd, and Senator Mark Warner. Um, you can find all of their bios and the rest of the agenda at AsperCyberSummit.org, as well as watch the previous two days of sessions and today's earlier sessions. Um, for a final time today and for a final time during the summit, I want to thank FireEye, Intel, and Proofpoint for helping to make this summit possible, along with Blue Vector, SIGPA NA, and the American Gas Association for their additional support, and turn it over to my colleague, John Carlin. Sorry, I had a bit of a, a, an audio issue as, as we said the Cyber Summit. I, I wanna welcome, uh, welcome our guests and also to remind folks that the, please submit questions and I will try to read them as we get towards the end of our session today. We've just heard from CISA's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Acting Director and we will have with us today, I think he's joining a little bit later, Senator Warner, who's the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Representative Will Hurd, who's in addition to being the co-chair of the Aspen Cybersecurity Group, is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Intelligence Modernization and Readiness and on the House Intelligence Committee, and Representative Underwood from the Subcommittee on Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection and Innovation. And I thought I'd, I'd start with where we just ended, which is we just heard from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency's Acting Director, CETA, from the Department of Homeland Security. And the reason why we have an Acting Director is that the President fired the Director of CISA, Chris Kretz. And maybe I will start with uh, Representative Underwood and then turn to Representative uh, Heard, but to see what what do you make of the firing of one of our lead cybersecurity officials? Well, John, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, really delighted to be here. I want to start by saying that I really oppose any effort to politicize the work of our national security departments and agencies. Our last worldwide threat assessment warned that our adversaries were gonna use their cyber capabilities to undermine the United States and advance their own interests. And we know that it, uh, adversaries have used cyber tools to steal intellectual property and personal data and engage in espionage and execute destructive and expensive attacks. And so towards that end, I was really disturbed when C Director Krebs was terminated ostensibly for doing his job. For one thing, CISA's leadership should largely be commended and not punished for their quick work building a strong election security partnerships. But more broadly, I'm concerned about the kind of message it sends to our adversaries when a competent and successful leader is purged from a top security agency. And I hope that Brandon Wales, who you all just heard from, I heard the tail end of his comment, um, will remain in place and provide some stability until the Biden administration names a permanent successor. And I know that Mr. Wales has also spoken um, at you know, the summit. He's been a great partner of ours on the committee, the Homeland Security Committee. And I'm really confident that the hardworking employees at CISA, and especially the cybersecurity workforce who've been chosen to lend their talents to the government security mission, I know that they're going to continue forward. Um, now, we know that there is an NDAA provision establishing a five-year term for the CISA director, and I understand that there were concerns about that in the Senate, so I believe that we're going to be reassessing that in the next Congress, um, but, you know, obviously, the news of the last month was disturbing, excited to work with Mr. Wales and uh, continue forward. And what about turning, turning to you, uh, Will, you were, you were quick to call to congratulate President-elect uh, Biden and curious both what you make of, 
of the firing and whether you've seen any evidence in the last month that's shaken your belief that this election was conducted in a free, fair, and, and secure manner, which is apparently the comments that got former director Krebs in, in trouble. Well, when when Chris was, was fired, I think my comment was he should have been thanked, uh, not fired for, for being responsible for one of the most secure elections um, we've ever had. There is no evidence to suggest otherwise. And what I find interesting is I helped Mike McCall create CISA. And there was a lot of debates a a number of years ago about whether we should even have an entity uh, like CISA. And I'm I'm at least glad that now we're we're having debates um, about the leadership of it. And and I think Chris Krebs did an amazing job of taking a new organization that there was a lot of doubts about its effectiveness and turning it into honestly a a top premier entity um, within, within the federal government. And to do that, and, you know, when the microscope was, was upon him. And, and so I, I think CISA is important. I think Mr. Wales is going to continue that tradition that, um, that Chris Krebs uh, said. But, but ultimately, his firing was ridiculous. And, and Congressman, uh, you've, you've, I won't say an island, but there aren't too many others from your party, including those who in the past have been very supportive of CISA, its mission, national security, who has uh, spoken as bluntly as you just did. What, why do you think that is? And is that something that, that can be addressed? Well, I, you, you're going to have to ask them, but my, my philosophy has always been the same, right? I agree when I agree. I disagree when I disagree. Um, I agreed with some of the things President Obama did. I disagree with many of the things he did. And I spoke out. And I, I've done the same thing under under this administration. And, and I think as as my friend Lauren said in her opening remarks, we should not be politicizing um, the intelligence community or intelligence operations or when it comes to something as important as the integrity of, of, of our vote, right? Um, and, and again, I think, I think Chris Krebs and his team um, should be commended uh, for, for what they did. And we could even talk about Jay Johnson and what Jay Johnson did. I remember, you know, I was the first person to hold a hearing on the 2016 elections before the 2016 elections happened. And I was talking about firing, uh, the, the, the kicking the Russian ambassador out of the country. And we were having debates when Jay Johnson said, uh, voting infrastructure was critical infrastructure and everybody freaked out and was like, this is going to be, you know, the federal government taking over the elections. Like, no, everybody, you know, calm down, take a deep breath. Um, and so this is a tradition of, of folks that are actually in the government doing their thing, um, not getting a pat on the back for it. Some of them get in the boot, uh, like my, like my friend, um, but in the end, this isn't going to, you know, the people that I know that have worked in this are going to make sure they're doing everything they can uh, to keep America safe. And I turn to you, Congressman Underwood, do you, do you agree? And in, in going to that, uh, the issue of critical infrastructure right now, as has been discussed, CISA has been working cooperatively, but without direct authority, the mandate when it comes to improving election infrastructure and what, is that the right balance? Should we be thinking about a change? What are your thoughts? Well, I just want to pick up on what Will just said, which is all this is about keeping America safe. And we know that we have many of these different um, critical infrastructure designations. Um, even during COVID-19, right, we've seen just these repeated attacks on our healthcare infrastructure, which really had never been the center of our critical infrastructure conversations, right? We know that, yeah, it was listed and yeah, they were included, but there wasn't energy and effort and investment, right? And building those capacities. And now during a pandemic, we're seeing some real negative repercussions, even in the headlines today about vaccine distribution and the cyber attacks there. I mean, all of this is connected. And so when I think about CISA and the opportunities moving forward, um, I see two challenges carrying out the mission. One is budget, the budget is limited. And two, as you mentioned, their authorities are really pretty limited. I mean, CISA is responsible with securing uh, the networks of federal agencies, 99 federal agencies. We heard Mr. Rails talk about that at the end. Um, But then they're also, you know, with this billion dollar budget, it just doesn't cut the breadth of what they're supposed to be doing. And so we've been trying to get some additional funding for the agency. We're going to keep fighting to do that. Um, But I do think that in terms of the authorities, uh, we're going to have to just continue to work with our colleagues in Congress, right? Cybersecurity uh, work has been split across different 
committees in the Congress. <laughs> Everybody, I mean, we have jurisdictional problems. Girl, even don't start. Don't, don't, don't start with that word jurisdiction. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, I mean, it has to be said, yeah. right? So then when we look at the agency, of course, the agency has, you know, some challenges in asserting its own uh, authorities. And so, you know, this is going to be probably a continuing conversation, John, if we're going to be really candid about it. Um, but I think that at least we have the opportunity in forums like this to, to raise these issues. If I can add on that, look, I, I think the, the next step is you have CISA have authority within the .gov space, okay? That is where, where CISA is, is, has, was originally designed to be. Let them focus and have some of that authority on, you know, uh, commerce if commerce isn't doing something right. You know, that is probably the logical place where you can expand, where they have that stick as, as Mr. Wells was, was talking about, because that was, the, that was the goal, was to say, hey, this was the entity that's gonna help make sure you improve this. You also need to make sure that OMB plays a role, and, and we're gonna get a little wonky here on the, on the entities that are involved in this. OMB has some oversight over these areas as well too. And, and so they have to empower folks there because we gotta get beyond. The, the question we should, be the, we should be talking about is, is how are we going to have um, uh, a quantum resilient infrastructure in this country? How are we gonna be able to have an infrastructure that's res resilient to general artificial intelligence, right? If the Chinese were to lead on that. And so, so us talking about, you know, Washington gets caught up in, in some of these talking about this one little thing when we forget that this is a freaking war, right? And, and we need to be arrayed as best we can. And we're not gonna have enough money to, to, to solve all this. And it has to be in cooperation and partnership with, with people. And we need those folks in the Senate to get to what, I'm just saying, we didn't solve Senator Warren and John on. Uh, it's, it's Senator <laughs> Warren is gonna solve all these problems. So it's all good. A good, a good hand over to uh, Senator, Senator Warren and we're glad you're gonna uh, solve, apparently right now, all of our cybersecurity uh, problems here and into the future, but, but welcome, uh, you joined a little bit late. Let me, as we turn to you, I, I think both of the representatives have, have talked about the fact that it can be difficult getting legislation passed through through Congress, and particularly in hold this, it, hold in it, this hold area. It. John, John, it's difficult to get legislation passed through Congress? <laughs> I mean, Will and I only worked for three years on what was like the lowest hanging fruit, IoT basic security in this realm, so... That's exactly where I was going to go. They see that uh, to quote CyberScoop, Congress just did something it rarely does. It passed a bill, a meaningful cybersecurity bill. And they were referring exactly to that, the Internet of Things uh, cyber bill. I know that, that you and Will were co key co-sponsors and intimately involved. And so I turn to you first on what does it do and why does it matter? Well, first of all, I apologize for being late. Um, you know, it was great to see Congressman Hurd and Congressman Underwood. Uh, you know, on a non-related topic, um, you know, we are deep, deep, deep into trying to see if we can actually not do something tremendously stupid again, which would be leave for the holidays and not do some level of COVID relief package. So there is an active bipartisan group that's working on that. And we might, we might surprise the country again um, uh, on, in terms of getting stuff done. On IoT and uh, you to me, this was an example. It was, thank God it happened, but oh my gosh, it should not have been this hard. We all know people uh, within the Aspen world understand you know, we are purchasing literally billions of IoT connected devices. You know, we talk about 5G a lot. Well, you need 5G to be able to bring all the sensors and IoT connected devices really to their full utilization. If we're ever gonna have driverless cars, it's, uh, it's gonna be based on a lot of IoT devices. Yet the surface space of all these additional devices really add another vulnerability point. So we thought at first that maybe we could mandate across the country. And of course, we then pulled back and said, um, could we at least say that if we're going to use taxpayer money and the government's going to be buying these devices, they ought to have some level of de minimis security? Uh, because otherwise, we would be out you know, for all the good we've tried to do with cybersecurity, just increasing our, our surface vulnerability exponentially by literally billions of devices. 
And we had a pretty low standard. I would ask both the Congress members to, to weigh in. It wasn't like we tried to go to the highest common denominator. We went to the lowest common denominator. We said, let's at least make sure they're patchable. Let's make sure there's not an embedded passcode. Let's make sure just the not even great cyber hygiene, but at least minimal cyber hygiene. And what we frankly found um, is that you know, the high-end device makers um, were basically okay with this. I was, did a call with Microsoft earlier. They, they've been generally supportive. The low-end, extraordinarily cheap devices, um, they fought us tooth and nail, even though the, the cost would only be a few pennies uh, per device. So we ended up getting there. It took three years and, and um, a lot more effort than, uh, and frankly, it was more on the Senate side of the House. It wasn't really as much the House. So I got to give them credit where credit's due. Um, but it does set up a, a de minimis process. And then there were lots of intervening, you know, who's going to be taking the lead and you know, there was all these bureaucracy and Congressman nodding on that. And you know, it probably took an extra year, even once we kind of got agreement that this was what we were going to do, you know, who, what NIST was going to do, what Commerce was going to do, who was going to take all of the, the leads inside government. Is that a fair description or relatively fair? Look, Senator Warner, I, I think it's, it's you know, you, you're 100% right. It's even more basic. Even if you can't patch this thing, you got to have a plan on how to how to defend, you know, that, that you can still defend uh, those widgets. Right. And so this was a, this was this was, you know, like the first letter of the alphabet, you know, um, and but we, we got it done. And and, and this and, 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 and guess what? Legislation is not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy to get things through this place. It was des it's, it was a design element of, of the system. Um, but when you have smart people, uh, Robin Kelly, this is, you know, her bill on the house and, and Senator Warner, you can actually get some things done. And, and look, I'm excited. We're going to probably um, pass a, a, a national strategy on artificial intelligence next week. Um, and at a, we had got through six committees. Um, and, and so, uh, so, so th there, there is hope and it's still, I think this is one of those areas um, cybersecurity in general. I, I would also add the threat of the, the the Chinese government when it comes to global leadership and advanced technology. It's still a bipartisan issue. And how do we make sure we keep these issues a bipartisan issue? Um, and and like I said, this has been a great area that I've been able to work on the last couple of years. Well, congratulations on a on a bipartisan accomplishment with with the Internet of Things legislation. As you know, uh, Will, it's one we long talked about in the in the group at, at cyber and it's, it's such an important basic uh, basic step to take. Let me ask you know, more broadly in speaking about a, a theme of areas where we can work in a, in a bipartisan slash nonpartisan way, what, what do, uh, turning, turning it to all panelists, but what did the Trump administration get right about cybersecurity and the intersection of national security and technology? that the Biden administration should continue? And where are there areas where the, the Biden administration should do something differently? Who do you want to start? Uh, Go ahead. I'll, I'll start it off. So uh, um, look, I, I, think, I, think the, I think the Trump administration, you know, when, when it comes to deterrence, you gotta have capability and will. And, and, and one, of the, one of my frustrations with the, with the Obama administration was never naming and shaming um, some of the actors. And I know there was always uh, that were involved in cyber attacks. And, and so I know there's general attribution versus- versus Never, um, some of us indicted them. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much, John, okay? That was, this was after you left. This was after you left. Um, so so I, I, think, I think the Trump administration um, did a did a good job on, on on that area, and I think that's something that I hope uh, the Biden administration uh, continues. Look, I, I think I think the fact that CISA had the support and the strength that it did throughout its years to get to where it was um, that was um, that was a, a positive thing that that evolved um, that evolved over time, and and I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty confident. Uh, that's some, something that um, the Department of Homeland Security will continue under a Biden administration. 
They'll turn to Congressman Under Underwood and then to Senator Warner. Yeah, I think that there's um, not been a, ch I mean, obviously in the last four years, we've seen a real threat from state sponsored agencies and actors across um, the globe. So Huawei and ZTE. And I think that uh, President elect Biden understands that. And we're going to continue to have a pretty serious uh, standing and posture towards that end. But when I think about, you know, where we can really make a shift. Um, there's a lot of work that we need to do to re rebuild public trust in government agencies and democratic norms and institutions. And I think that, you know, it's easy to think about just like elections when I say something like that, you know, kind of democracy type language, but I think it extends to the whole mission of um, all the agencies that interact in this uh, cyber uh, arena. And I think that, you know, it's going to take concerted leadership um, an active engagement with um, stakeholders across the spectrum. So not just like the expert stakeholders or just the private industry stakeholders, but like the end user who might, you know, eventually feel the impact of this internet of things, <laughs> right? Uh, advancement that we passed and just roll their eyes instead of saying, well, oh, wait, actually, let's make sure that my data and privacy are being secure. Let's make sure that, you know, somebody's looking out because who knows where my data is going, right? And, and, um, I think right now that there's just like a lot of bitterness, right? A, a lot of people who are just um, fed up and uh, there's just gonna be a lot of work we need to do even in this realm with restoring public confidence and trust. Let me, let me weigh in and agree with both the, my, my colleagues, um, maybe just state it a slightly different way. Um, I think President Trump was directionally right on China. Uh, and I was, you know, I would put myself in the category of, of being wrong. Yeah, I was part of the conventional wisdom crowd. The more you bring China in, the closer they're going to come uh, to us. And when I say China, I think it's always important to say my beef is not with the Chinese people or Chinese Americans, obviously. It's with the Communist Party of China. Um, but I think the implementation um, left a lot to be desired. Uh, it was kind of a hammer, hammer, hammer. And, you know, I think they were right, for example, to move on Huawei. But because we didn't do it with any framework, when the Trump administration moved to TikTok, there was really wasn't a case made. I think we, we, we haven't made the kind of efforts around standards, rules, protocols. We need to have a kind of a comprehensive theory of the case. And to Congressman Underwood's comments, some of that's got to rely on basic trust um, in, our, in our institutions. I think it was a huge mistake that we didn't move on any ramifications for sloppy actors in the private sector. The fact that you know 160 million of our Americans' personal data got stolen from Equifax and there was no penalty, you know, that doesn't encourage and stimulate better behavior. And I think we could have, we could have, um, they could have weighed in there. I think it, it's been interesting that the administration this oh, oh, tangential to direct cyber, but I think it's important. The fact that we're four years in, we still don't have privacy legislation. Uh, around our platforms is is crazy, uh, and you know that we've not done anything. A series of bipartisan bills I've got in the Senate around data portability, or around interoperability, or around trying to make sure people knew the value of their data, or or the ability to prohibit things like dark patterns. And so the administration never engaged on those issues, and now in the you know fourth quarter with two minutes left, has suddenly made Section 230 total repeal their top issue. That. That's, that's a zigzag approach that doesn't bring the coherence, which also then breeds the trust that I think we will need and have to expect. Because again, as, as Lauren indicated, if we don't make, make, ha have the trust that Americans think, say when we say this stuff, that it really is going to affect their lives. And it's, we're not going to say things rashly, but they're going to be the result of a, a thoughtful approach um, and uh, we, we lose our, our muster. Final thing I guess I'd say is I really believe that the Biden administration, and I'm obsessed about these technology issues, not just cyber, but you know, 5G, AI, quantum, go down the list, that China is winning the battle. 
they're setting the standards, they're setting the rules and protocols. They've got this authoritarian capitalism where you know, they have a national champ, their national champion gets 75 to 80% of their domestic market. That's 20% of the global market. They then get back with, with the Belt and Road Initiative and unlimited financing. There is no American or even any other Western enterprise that can compete against that under normal capitalism rules. So I think we're gonna need this kind of alliance of the willing uh, in the technology space, spot, cyber being a piece of that. Uh, and that's going to look different than previous alliances. It will be five eyes, but it'll also be, I hope, Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and potentially India and Israel, along with some of our traditional NATO partners. But that's got to be you know, a, a true alliance. It's got to be values-based, and it's going to require collaboration in a lot of these fields. Another question for the group and following up on something Senator uh, Warner said. So if one of the one of the goals for the new administration would be to ensure that there's a, a coherent, centrally driven approach that cuts across a range of issues to try to diminish cybersecurity risk. One of the suggestions has come from the Solarium Commission to create a position that would fill that function. It seems like the National Defense Authorization Act, which might have been one vehicle for implementing that, uh, looks a little less certain uh, perhaps today uh, than it has. So I wanted to just uh, do a, a quick poll through the group. What do you think of that recommendation about a national cyber uh, director? If not done through NDA, do you have other suggestions of how to do it? And are there other key reforms from the Solarium Commission that you would prioritize? And start with uh, Congresswoman Underwood and move to uh, Congressman Hurd and then back to Senator Warner. Yeah, I gotta tell you, so I've only been the chair <laughs> for a couple of months. We haven't quite gotten to that. So I'm gonna defer to my colleagues on the panel. So, so John, um Having a, a centralized person focus on this, the, the key is, is who's the person, right? You know, we can get a good one. But, but my fear uh, around this particular issue is that everybody should be focused on this. We, we can't just have one person, you know, setting the policy. This, this is too big. It's moving too fast. Uh, we have to have everybody. I, I think removing um, Mr. Painter out of the State Department was probably... A, a, a bigger hit because we need someone building those coalitions with all of our allies or, 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 or around the world on engaging on these norm settings and things that Senator Warner was talking about. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, it's in, in my opinion, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. I fear that if you have one centralized place, it takes responsibility off of everybody else to be focused on this. Or unless this person is going to crack the whip and make sure everybody's doing playing playing their part. So uh, the 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 individual matters. I think how um, you know President Biden wants to view his national security staff and and where he wants to put someone. I, I think that that is that is up to them on on how to on how to on how to pursue this issue. And I think the generally that the, the um, Solarium's recommendations were. We're pretty darn good. Uh, mm -hmm. Angus came and briefed me on it uh, a few weeks ago, but I, and, and I don't know, I had them all in the front of my head. I kind of agree though with, with Will is that this is a, maybe it, it, it's dependent on who that person is and how much power is he or she gonna have? Because unless they've, you know, if it, you, know, you probably need somebody in the White House who's got this responsibility, but are we gonna really empower that person with the enough tools to, um, um, to bring all of the public side of the house and the private side of the house kind of to bear. I, I, um, I don't know, I, and I, cyber is, is so pervasive. I had a brief yesterday from uh, a couple of folks in, two days ago from the Intel community that was actually thinking about taking cyber back out as a standalone and kind of placing it back in, in all the various pieces of the, the intel world around you know counter espionage or counterintelligence or back in you know on counterterrorism rather than funneling i um so i'm i'm a, i'm giving a a unfortunately a little too political answer here because i you know it depends on who the person is how much actual power would come with that uh but i am i think will's point of if you if you unless you really make this position very powerful 
does it take away responsibility uh, from all the various other parts of the, the enterprise that need to have this a high priority? If, if, if no, Chris Krebs or his, his, his replacement can't tell someone at Commerce, uh, take that thing, take that widget off the, off the digital infrastructure, I think that is a more important thing that we need in order to, to defending digital infrastructure. Now, having someone coordinating this policy and, and if this person is going to be involved in, 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 in creating that coalition that Senator Warner was talking about to make sure that the standards and norms are based on our value system that, that Lauren ex expertly articulated, then, then that's a great idea. And let me just, you know, the closest uh, I, I got to kind of at least a cousin of this is when Richard Burr and I, you know, we got deeper and deeper into the 5G debate and we were trying to get, um, you know, the, uh, all of the working entities from across the federal government, we convened them because nobody in the White House convened them. And it was a lot of, you know, we had Commerce and we had DOD and we had NSA and we had, you know, there was four, uh, NTI, there was 15, 16, 18 different people at, at, this, uh, at this session. But, and then we can uh, converge them again, six months later, they'd not done anything because nobody was in charge. Um, and so, you know, are we gonna on cyber really give somebody the juice to do something? Um, we are gonna need this intersection, I think, and, you know, and maybe it's defined even broader than cyber between national security and between the NSA and the NEC on these convergence issues around technology. Uh, and that may be a model that's also worth exploring. Speaking of one convergent issue, and we've had some, some questions from, from the audience, and this is around the threat that's a little different than, than hacking, I think, and more complex in some ways, which is the threat of mis and dis information. And so there's been a lot of discussion about what, what are the special roles of social media companies in, in keeping us safe and in monitoring or policing some of this content. I think the debate started a little bit in the arena of terrorism, where it was easier to define what would be impermissible, maybe harder to implement how to keep, keep it off of those services, but easier to define. Now that it's moved into a broader range of content, there's been discussion about changing Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, as Senator Warner uh, mentioned, is, is a current priority. And so I wanted to, to open up a little bit as we think about the 117th Congress. Where do we think regulation is going to go in this space? What are the pros and cons to putting social media companies into a position where they're regulating content? Who do you want to start? Uh, if we could only raise hands, I'd jump all it. But uh, I'll, Senator Warren, why don't you? you this, is, yeah. <laughs> this is one I'm a little, I'm a little obsessed about. So you know, because uh, I think I, you know, I like to set at least set the table on this with, if we look at what the Russians did in 2016, in our elections, if, if what they did in the Brexit vote, what they did so obviously in Macron's in the presidential election in France, and add up all that activity, and it it was both cyber hacking into information and releasing it, and then disinformation. Add their combined expenditures on all three of those efforts, it's less than the cost of one new F-35 airplane. So this is both effective and wicked cheap. And so the asymmetrical value, whether it's cyber attacks or whether it is misinformation, disinformation, is um, um, not gonna go away, it's only gonna increase, uh, number one. Number two, um, we were totally caught off guard. Our Intel community was caught off guard, the platform, the arrogance of the platform companies was pretty stunning to me. Uh, and we've gotten better and, and folks like the, at the NSA have gotten better and Chris Krebs obviously did a great job with our infrastructure and um, we maybe didn't have as much foreign disinformation but we had plenty of domestic disinformation uh, coming forward. So what do we do? I would put on, on the social media companies two buckets. One bucket are these things trying to increase more competition. That's where I put data portability. That's where I put the, the detour act in terms of dark patterns. That's where I put letting consumers know the value of their data. And there's a series of other items around that book. The other on, on the content itself, I think section 230 maybe made sense when these were startup enterprises in the late nineties and we thought of them as dumb pipes. 
There's nothing dumb about the Facebook and Google algorithms that deliver news in some form or another, 65% of Americans. So the idea that the 90s framework works in 2020 and 2021 doesn't make sense to me at all. I'm not all the way on full repeal, but I do think, you know, things like these social media companies should not be able to avoid enforcement of civil rights laws. They should not be able to afford, uh, avoid international enforcement in terms of injunctive relief. If uh, the Myanmar troops are killing the Rohingya and there's uh, an injunctive action brought to take things down, I don't think they should be able to avoid as they had with the Grinder case, personal harassment. And I don't think even no matter how much you think about free speech, that that free speech right extends to paid advertising. So there are an areas that we could look at, and then there's a whole question around speech versus amplification. You might have the right to say anything you want, crazy or dangerous, um, but I'm not sure that right should be guaranteed to have it amplified. Uh, and clearly we've already shown with section 230, there are cracks, you know, we've prohibited sex trafficking, child pornography, bomb making. Um, I think this is an area that's ripe for additional reform. Thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Underwood. I, I just want to say a couple of things. One, you know, this has really come to the fore because, at least this week, because of a personal grievance from the president. And I think that we just really need to sit with that um, when we talk about um, where can we go with this, because I just don't want this conversation to be tainted because he is feeling personally affronted in this way, right? Like, uh, we've had to call it out. Okay. Um, I hope that in the next Congress, the House is going to continue its work on a range of issues. So yes, this is important, but there's so many other uh, relevant technology issues, right? Ransomware attacks, antitrust issues, election security issues, the disinformation that you started out talking about, which is huge. I have my own bill protecting Public Safety Disinformation Act on Homeland. Um, and, you know, I hope that Again, we don't forget, while, especially while we're in the pandemic, what's going on in the healthcare space with these different technologies. It's, it's just the intersections abound. Um, and I think that, you know, with strong partners in the Biden administration, there's, there's a lot that we're going to be able to do. Um, but I do think that with Section 230, um, that we can move forward in a bipartisan way um, across these jurisdictional issues that Will and I touched on earlier to reach consensus on a proposal um, to hold companies accountable and incentivize them to address like actually dangerous content that's proliferating online. However, um, I think that the incentives to get there just, you know, may not always present themselves the way that they have this week because of the president's engagement. So it's real, I mean, <laughs> it's my hope that we really are serious and thoughtful about this in the next Congress. I don't know that that will happen. Before, before President Trump started beating his chest on this issue, uh, the far left and the far right were kind of in agreement and wanting to do something on, on Section 230, even though it was for the exact opposite reason. And, and I, I think now the political life is no longer a line. It's a horseshoe. And the edges are closer to each other. And this is definitely going to be an issue um, on, on in, in the next Congress that is looked at from a, a lot of different ways. But is... is um, Facebook or Twitter amplifying somebody's speech different than, than somebody going on Yelp and saying the pad thai at this restaurant was a little runny, right? And, and, and so, so, you know, the, even the nuance within the various platforms um, and, and what should be covered uh, is important. And, and what's even more difficult, and I think disinformation is, is, is one of the most dangerous things that's happening in our country right now, because are we in a post, post-fact world, right? And so, it, and, and that trust that, that has been eroded that Lauren talked about earlier, part of that trust has been eroded because of people reading and, and is consuming disinformation. Now, there's some basic stuff. We all learn as kids, don't get into a car with a stranger, asterisk, unless it's like Uber or Lyft, right? Why are we sharing information from people? We have no clue who they are, okay? And, and so on some of these platforms, if you can't authenticate the user, should that user be able to talk to anybody, right? Unless it's within your closed network. I think, I think there's, 
you know, to, 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 to look at smart regulations here, you're going to have to have people that you, you can't have a one size fits all solution ultimately to this problem. And the government's role in this is going to be ultimately limited because how can you say whether something is fact or fiction? Somebody criticizing a vote that I take on a piece of legislation, you know, and it, it, is that fact or fiction when they when they when they abuse that or or, or, or misinterpret that? And and the last thing I would say, and, and John, you led into this question, uh, you were alluding to CVE countering violent extremism. We know how to deal with disinformation, the terrorism content, right? Um, but but in this case, when it's directed at um, our, our, our by Americans against Americans, right? Uh, this is a form of covert action. And covert action is the responsibility of the, of the intelligence communities. And the intelligence communities are told you can't deal with covert action in the United States of America. So the entities that know how to deal with this information um, shouldn't and can't um, be involved be involved in this in this topic. So who should be leading on this issue? Who should be driving the, the conversation? We need the public sector. We need academia. We need the media to step up. And because because that the trust is not just there's not a lack of trust in just up and down the, the stack in government. It's also the lack of trust in, in, in traditional media. And it's a lack of trust in, in other institutions. So all these folks have to have to come together and, and figure out how we how we rebuild that trust with the American people. And John, can I just add one extra comment here? And I think both what Lauren and Will said, I, I agree with us that this is an area, you know, our inability to come with any rational um, regulation for the platform companies even as basic as privacy is, is I think the platform companies got so big, so arrogant, uh, and they thought, oh, great, we can take advantage of the dysfunction and candidly the ignorance of a lot of members of Congress and just push regulation. So instead of our country leading on this, you know, we got the Europeans on GDPR, you got California going with its privacy variation, you got the Christchurch call on content. I, I think you're starting to see, and I see it as basic um, with Facebook on something like data portability, they're all in now because I think they're starting to realize, you know, they got what they wish, no regulation. By the time we do come back and regulate, and we will at some point, the standards and level and the, the type of regulation is going to be much, much more serious than what it would have been a year ago, two years ago, or five years ago. Yeah. And, and, and John, <laughs> yeah. I, look, look th th this is, you know, uh, private sector is leading in, in, in entrepreneurship and, and creativity. We got to have our electoral, you know, the, the, the public sector uh, to advance as well, because the only way that the, the American economy is going to be able to compete with state-owned enterprises in China is if the public sector and the private sector is actually working together. Oh, and by the way, we got to loop our allies into this also. And, and so, so this is where we have to get this right. And, and look, it starts with the breach law, a national breach law. It starts with, with privacy, uh, because I, I think the next question that we're gonna be seeing a lot is, is, is your attention a, a, an extractable resource, right? And it's like, that's a whole, that opens up a whole uh, another, another, another can of worms. But, but we have to remember when we're having these debates, we're in the middle of a freaking race. And the, the, a, a communist government is able to array all their resources in one direction and potentially get to a point uh, quicker. And so this, is the, this has to be in the back of our heads is that we have to deal with these issues now because we want our belief in individual rights and protecting minority rights and human rights. We want that to be what the global standard is. And we know how the Chinese uh, Communist Party is trying to export this their, their know-how and their tactics to, to other authoritarian regimes. Final, uh, well said, and, and final round of, of questions before we wrap up. I think Senator Warner touched on it uh, when, he, when he talked about the ignorance of Congress. And Will, I know you've talked about that as well. And it's not just a problem with, with Congress, right, with boards of director, with senior officials. This is a newer area. It's a technical area. And maybe the last, last lightning round for all three of you, because you've all become uh, taken the time to study and become experts in, in this area. What do we do to get the basic knowledge into the hands of policy makers and to key uh, corporate leaders so that they understand the risks well enough to assess them like they would in other areas or in your case to, to legislate? 
Well, we welcome hearing from all of you on uh, the Homeland Security Sublimate, Subcommittee on Cyber Infrastructure Protection and Innovation. You can reach out to us. Like, I want I want to know what people think and you know where we should be going. And you can reach out. Um, my staff is on here, but I'll just give out her email because she loves that. <laughs> Chelsea.blink, like blinking your eye at mail.house.gov. Hit us up. Let us know um, where we should be going for this 117th Congress. Um, and we want to continue to engage with experts, industry experts, private sector, et cetera, as we uh, chart this path forward to keep America safe. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I just John, I'll add and let, and let Senator, Senator close, it up, close us out. Um, we also, we need to be able to pay, Congress needs to be able to pay its staff more. And because, and because and, and we want to make sure that we have some, some real pipe hitters on all these relevant committees. And, and we need to make sure that when we're training staff and, and we like if, look, I want more staffers that have a computer science background, a minor in political science or a political science a major with a minor in data analytics uh, coming up and not only working at, at for, for Lauren on Homeland Security subcommittee, uh, the cybersecurity subcommittee, but also at CISA. And, and or they have had some experience in the private sector as well. So creating that cross pollinization where we have staff and, and look, we have, we have, you know, fellows, I have a state department fellow who's amazing, right? Let's get some of these, some, some people that have that experience and get them into the government for two uh, or three years. And then they get out and, and, and create that back and forth. But we don't have, to, we, we, we need to focus on, on educating individual members. And I'll be, I'll be honest, I'll be surprised at how these members have, have, have recognized the problem, but we need, we need some hard hitting staff to understand these issues. Well, there, there you hear the retiring guy calling for higher salaries for staff. Hey, I voted for it. I voted, I voted for it before. I voted for it before. <laughs> and, and also the, what he also just did was he kind of re, reminded me, you gave us a little compliment there on three years of kind of a, should have been a no brainer getting an IOT bill. Actually, Will and I worked on the national breach law as well. That's one that should have been done six years ago. I think <laughs> many of us started working. So I, I, uh, I agree we need input, like Lorna said. I do think we need more expertise that we can draw on on a regular basis. I think some of this will happen just as we more and more newer members come in. Some of this is less Democrat, Republican, and more age related. Um, but I think if we're gonna really, um, have accountability, there's got to be some penalties for failure to meet de minimis standards. I still go back to Equifax. The fact that that, you know, they took a short-term bump in their stock price. The CEO kind of resigned in shame, but there was no penalty paid. You know, a year later, it was just built into the cost of doing business. And sloppy cyber hygiene if there's not some penalty on that, and I don't, not sure, you know, whether it's purely a liability standard, I'm not sure I know, but there's gotta be some cost of not, not doing the right thing. And that has to be, um, we need to, to put some of those rules in place and industry needs to uh, um, realize that this is, has to be a much, much higher priority than it's been to date. We will end on that note. Thank you to all three of our panelists for a great conversation on with not just important topics, but I think will be the defining topics for our, for our time. And with that, uh, and on that note, we wrap up our three-day Aspen Cyber Summit.